A frequent destination for the Zeppelin tours, the Royal Orleans Hotel was built in 1960 on the structure of the old St. Louis Hotel, ruined by the 1915 New Orleans hurricane. The Zeppelin stayed here during their 1973 and 1977 tours. Lyrics-wise, it ain't poetry, but a nasty practical joke and jab by Robert Plant. The song is about John Paul Jones who picked up a drag queen and went to his room. They smoked a joint and fell asleep. Her room was allegedly burned down as a lit spliff fell to the ground. Unlike their previous records, this is Robert's first mention of someone from the band exposed to the public. Presence was a turning point for Plant's writing, as he addressed his own recollections and battles within the organization like his very own swan song. John Paul Jones quote, Oh, that was Robert in his usual homophobic manner. Everybody knew who those drag wings were. They were friends of Richard Cole, and yes, we knew they were transvestites. We were friends. Her name was Stephanie. We'd seen her every time we go to New Orleans. But Robert was a bit provincial. They weren't like big city boys. They don't like that sort of thing. They were friends of the band, for God's sake, you know? Now on to the music. We have a distinctive intro with guitars, bass and drums playing in unison. The intro riff seems to be inspired by Deep Purple's Coronarius Dreddig from 1974. The song also borrows from one of the rhythm sections from In My Time of Dying, plus added inventive guitar harmonies by Page. With its funk-inspired verse, it's the cousin to the crunch. A small modulation and trick to F sharp occurs during the guitar solo in the same vein of Over the Hills and Far Away. Some people say there's a slight influence of the meter's sissy strut in here, which I can understand in shape and form, but I don't really hear it on Royal Orleans. Fun fact, the meters were the backup band for Atlantic Records Party in New Orleans during the Zeppelin's 1973 tour. The 2015 deluxe edition of Presence gave us a rough mix of Royal Orleans with a mysterious and hilarious vocal track. People claim it's Bonzo, others say it's Robert or Jumple Jones. I would like to know your thoughts in the comment section. I think it's Bonzo. The second funk rock piece from Presence and Sister to Roy Orleans, based around the Walters Walk riff again. Man, did Jimmy maximize its potential making Stebio in the 1972 versions of Taste and Confused, plus the Houses of the Holy Sessions via Walters Walk. An old riff can always get you out of songwriting trouble. The Zeppelin love the start and stop dynamics to further amplify a hard rocking groove and this is no exception. It's deceptively simple, but once you take a closer look at the drum, bass and guitar sections, things can get crazy very quickly with displaced beats, tricky riffs and grooves that grow tighter with each bar. There's a drum beat around the 420 mark that sounds like Bonzo losing it for a second. Once you hear it, you cannot unhear it. The chorus is played over a familiar EDA chord progression like Communication Breakdown, and although it sounds like a party where everyone's having a good time, the lyrics find Robert talking about his frustration after the car accident and the vibes within the organization. He felt Jimmy Page and Peter Grant did not understand his situation and point of view. Robert's words here are very straightforward and without him knowing, foresee future devastating events. Plan growing unhappy and Page carrying on with the show seems like a wound that never healed. I'm surprised 1980s Robert Plant never played this song. The depressing verses against the excited and happy chorus are disturbing once you think of the events of 1977 and how they happen in the midst of the rock and roll carousel. Because the song has no slow section, it creates a feeling of isolation in a way that's conceptual, intriguing and speaks of how Robert was kind of ignored really. How can no one in the band realize what he was talking about, I wonder. Here's a look at the lyrics. I was burned in the heat of the moment. No, it could have been the heat of the day. When I learned how my time had been wasted, dear fellows, I turned away. Now I've got friends who will give me their shoulder, when it should happen to fall. The timing is right growing older, 
I've got friends who will give me f all. As the moon and the stars call the order, inside my tide stands the ebb and sway. The sun in my soul sinking lower, while the hope in my hands turns to clay. I don't ask that my fields full of clover, I don't moan at opportunity's door. And if you ask my advice, take it slower. Then your story'd be your finest reward. Quite a shame this one was never performed live as it fits the 70s vibe, musically speaking. Prefame Van Halen performed this one on their mid 70s show. Can we say this was a perfect Zeppelin song for them? This had to be an influence on David Lee Roth's narration style singing while the others enjoyed the instrumental challenge. Early Van Halen was on fire. I don't really like the Van Hager era. There, I said it. Jimmy Page played Hot Sun for an hour eight times with the Black Crowes in the year 2000 to great effect. The guitar parts sounded close to the studio version. These passionate performances makes us wish they played presence in its entirety. Okay, so right off the bat, people claim this is a cover of a famous gospel blues artist, Blind Willie Johnson. While he recorded the song in 1927, this is not entirely true. You see, Robert Plant wanted to play this track, but Jimmy wrote a new musical arrangement, in much the style of 1969. Plant kept some of the original lyrics, so if you guys have any copyright claims, you go talk to him about it. Musically speaking, it's a very powerful combination of everything that makes Led Zeppelin what cover bands fear the most, that is silence between hard rock sections. The band's take was inspired by multiple sources, including John Brenborn, who did his own version on his 1967 album, Another Monday. One of the main differences from the Blind Willie Johnson composition is the fact that the verse stays on the E chord rather than switching to A. Page's intro of multiple guitars and different octaves captures your attention with the same fade-in technique from Achilles' Last Stand. I hear the influence of Deep Purple's Love Don't Mean a Thing from 1975 in here. Nobody's Fault But Mine sounds like the blues and guitar vocals duet of You Shook Me, but darker. It's no longer the enthusiasm of youngsters, but questioning if making deals with the devil was worth. I won't go into rabbit holes, but reading between the lines and the band's dynamics of 1975, I think this track is a confession of strange events behind closed doors. One of the most progressive rock segments in Led Zeppelin's catalog happens on this song when Jimmy and Robert play the main motif, while Jones and Bonham play those heavy accents that give you the sonic illusion of a polyrhythm. While the traditional 4-4 meter never changes, it's a bold statement of musicianship. The way they come back into the main groove is absurd and beautiful. Both Robert and Jimmy's solos have the perfect rhythm bass for a strong and unrelentless attack. It's no wonder this song was played from 1977 until their 1980 tour, as it benefits from the live show energy with extended lead guitar moments, plus the sudden stops here and there that made audiences go crazy. Like when the levee breaks and in my time of dying, Led Zeppelin could turn a simple blues into the sound of the underworld. Evil spirits and redemption clashing in the battle of guitar layers, roaring bass lines, massive drums, and shamanic bluesman vocals. Robert Plant started playing this as a solo artist back in 1988, all the way up to 1991. The track made a small comeback on the 2010s decade. Page and Plant did their own version of the song for their unleaded project and tours, it was closer to the Blind Willie Johnson original, with a slower tempo plus a drone effect. I guess this is what happens when you forget John Paul Jones' phone number. You just cannot play the Zeppelin version without him. Jimmy Page returned to the song with the Black Crowes for a three guitar recreation of the textures and feel from Presence. Jumple Jones played this song eight times on his solo tour from the year 2000.
Last but not least, Led Zeppelin played this song at the 2007 reunion. into rockabilly and rock and roll. This is a song that came from the Presence album, leans very heavily in that area. Uh, apologies to Johnny Otis, it's called Candy Store Rock. The bonus track to end all Zeppelin bonus tracks. Out of nowhere, this came out in the 2015 deluxe edition of Presence, and what a surprise it was. For all of us who thought no keyboards were used at Munich, this song changed everything we knew about the album. From the get-go, it's an emotional piece of beauty and poetry that seems to be inspired by hymns recorded by Elvis Presley. John Paul Jones delivers a delicate piano performance before the band jumps in to take us home, while a 1970s TV show credits roll. It feels like the ending of a great adventure and like many prophetic moments on Presence a signal of how the next studio album would be led by Jones. It doesn't take much to realize this track was not suited for the hard rock vibes of Presence. Bottom's groove, Jimmy's superb acoustic work and Jones' musical arrangement make this a gem in their catalog. If only Robert came up with lyrics not taking jabs at his bandmates, who knows what the song could have been. Okay, so first off, the song has a different feel from the rest of the tracks and presence, and it comes down to the drum sound. If you listen carefully to the opening groove, it has the physical graffiti room reverb. Back when I first heard the song in my late teens, I always felt something was off. The 2012 theater screening of Celebration Day confirmed my suspicions. If you compare both the studio and live versions, sessions at Munich show there was a slight tuning issue whenever Jimmy strums the G chord on his Stratocaster. Because there's heavy use of a tremolo bar in the song, Stratocasters have sensitive bridges and tuning becomes a problem sometimes. This out of tune sensation is distracting for my musician ears, but it can also bother non musicians as the 2007 reunion show with Jimmy playing his Black Beauty Liz Paul improved the sound big time. You can appreciate the attack with the guitar and bass in perfect unison. Jimmy bought this blue Stratocaster in 1975 in New York City and made its live debut at Else Court after a broken string on Sick Again. Why he used a Strat at the show was probably because his number two Les Paul was already tuned for Kashmir. So back to For Your Life. There's some Richie Blackmore influence here, from the opening G chord in Highway Star to the use of fourths found in Smoke on the Water, Burn, and Man on the Silver Mountain. But again, I sense Page liked Richie's guitar work as it did shape an important part of the 70s. For Your Life has one of the most complicated song structures on the album. Yes, it's harder to play than Akita's Last Stand. Here's why. We got the main riff four times, verse twice, main riff four times, verse twice, main riff four times, verse twice. Easy, right? 
Okay, then the main riff is played twice, bridge twice, then repeat the whole structure. Then we move into four bars of the funk riff in G minor. Past the funk, Jimmy plays an open G chord to then move into a downward arpeggio motif four times. The funk riff is back for eight bars, followed by a modulation into four bars in A minor. The open G chord comes back plus the arpeggio as preparation for the guitar solo, played over eight bars of the funk riff in G minor. Jimmy's lead guitar work has some Jeff Beck in there, as well as some of the physical graffiti against the groove guitar phrasing. The slightly dissonant overdubs and layers in the background create a sense of trouble that traps the listener like a substance. The song then comes back to the same introvert structure at the beginning, with a slight change on the bridge played four times, until the final single hit on the G chord to close the song. For all of us who wish they played more cuts from Presence on their 1977 tour, it comes down to how much rehearsal time and concentration you need to pull it off. It's not the best material to take on the road when personal and lifestyle choices may affect the end result. The 2702 Arena version had them far away from 70s success, and they rehearsed. For your life's lyrics criticize the excessive reach of cocaine in the LA scene back then and how it impacted people's lives. If there was something I learned from watching tons of E3 Hollywood Story episodes as a kid in the 90s was how drugs and addiction ruined the careers of artists and celebrities in the 70s. As a musician and day job office worker, I've seen cocaine everywhere. From rock venue backstage moments to people in accounting and enthusiastic managers who never go for lunch and stay awake for years. I've been offered the drug many times, but my reaction is always fear and hate for cocaine. The drug ruins so many, I just say, say no to drugs and say yes to life. Of course, your local drug pusher may tell you a little something different about these drugs. And who you believe is up to you. But then again, if you go ahead and try them, at least it won't be out of ignorance. Just stupidity. What would I do if someone offered me these drugs? I'd tell them to take a hike. A sonic treasure, an exquisite blues number that hides in the deepest waters of the Zeppelin discography. How the band arrived at T4-1 seems like a natural extension of early blues and rockabilly runs at SIR Studios in Los Angeles. The band kept moving within a rehearsal room, while the money-making machine stopped with so much potential energy, it had to come out through the pain and passion of the blues. T41 is the perfect ending for a hard-hitting album. We get a guitar intro and a deep pocket groove that tricks us. Just as we start to feel the double guitar harmonies and layers carefully placed side by side, an open G chord comes in to take us for a slow blues with such degree of surprise. It hits you like a drug, like a medication taking you places to sit back and exhale the pleasure and lessons life brings within. A sonic deja vu for Zeppelin fans with a very similar chord structure to Since I'll Be Loving You. T41 ditches the keyboards in favor of a four piece live in the studio guitars, bass, drums, and vocals. Where 1970 was passionate and heartbroken, 1975 was a sobering reflection on solitude and the price of fame, away from their families in the wealthy tax exile prison of hotels and expectations. The chordal structure for Since I've Been Loving You overall moves between a more traditional C minor and F minor segments. What makes T41 different is the use of B flat in the mix, which connects the C minor intention, adding to increased levels of nostalgia and despair. Jimmy's two guitar string motif that runs throughout the song can be heard as added textures on live versions of Stairway to Heaven and the song remains the same. Page was a fan of this lick that is usually found on vintage Spanish and Latin American guitar music. One of the earliest recordings of Jimmy playing this can be heard on Zeppelin's 1969 cover of As Long As I Have You. Bass and drums complement Page on his Les Paul lead guitar poetry that moves between restraint and bleeding out his emotions. One of their finest blues moments, it was an honest reflection of what the band was 
Well, Jimmy did play some of the guitar licks for T for One in Letter Day Live renditions of Since I've Been Loving You. It's a shame they never attempted the song itself. They had the fame and the audience to take the chance. What they never did puzzles me. T for One was played six times by Page and Plan on their 1986 tour, and it remains the only time the Zeppelin members attempted the song on stage. Joe Bonamassa, his own fantastic version in 2006, featuring Doc Hanthorne on vocals. Fun fact, Hanthorne was a lead singer for Healing Sixes, a band that toured and recorded with Jason Bonham on drums in the late 90s, early 2000s. Bonamassa's take is superb. He paid tribute to the original while adding his own flavor to it. The Rolling Stones booked Musicland Studios for overdubbing in December 1975. Their black and blue sessions were a year old, with Mick Taylor quitting the band back in December of 74. Jimmy Page had to work against the clock with engineer Keith Harwood to finish the record in time. Sleeping in the studio was the only way to battle 15 to 21 hour workdays. Jimmy Page called up Mick Jagger and asked for two extra days in Munich. Jagger agreed and Page worked like a madman to record overdubs for the songs. All of Achilles Last Dance bits and pieces were done in one night. Quite the throwback to his 60s session work and the lightning runs striking many songs. Just in case Jimmy needed extra motivation while working on the final mixes, Queen's Night at the Opera was released that month on the 21st. Final mixes for presents were ready on November 30th. December 1975. Led Zeppelin returned to Jersey Island after the recording sessions were over. They played a surprise gig at, I'm gonna guess the name here, Behan's, nowadays known as the Inn in the Park. The set lasted 45 minutes with Robert on crutches and a stool to rest his leg. It was the first on stage appearance by the band since May at Hell's Court. We go with the countdown. Coming down to the brand new year here in Times Square, New York City. The focal point of the brand new year of 1976. Happy New Year's Rockin' Eve! The Zeppelin teamed up with Hypnosis for the second time with design duties handled by George Hardy. He worked on their debut album, Genesis Slam Lies Down on Broadway and Wish You Were Here. It seems Hardy's appreciation of a white color album cover moved on to Presence. It looks similar to Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here. The main inspiration for the design was taken from the August 1956 edition of National Geographic. The article was about the boom of San Francisco Bay. 
Hypnosis decided to recreate the image using a background photo of an artificial marina from the annual boat show at Earl's Court Arena in the winter of 1974-1975. A photo shoot took place to capture the family at the table. This was later cut and added to the Earl's Court backdrop. A black object similar to the monolith from 2001 A Space Odyssey was painted into various scenes including the main cover. Known as the object, it was custom made for the black and white photos of the inner sleeve. The Zeppelin then hired Alva Museum Graphics in New York to make 1,000 individually numbered 12-inch tall objects for promotional use via Swan Song Records. These came in a brown cardboard box with a sticker that read the object. Many reproductions have been made years later, but the originals had flat black paint, smooth sides, and base. Spotting an original object can make Zeppelin collectors go crazy, like this episode from Pawn Stars. Now I need to share my thoughts on the album's imagery, which I find disturbing. While Hypnosis said the object represented force and presence, they didn't really explain what kind of force and presence. Looking at the events of 1977 and the tragic finale of the band in 1980, one cares to think of the object as some sort of bad omen waiting to happen. A closer look at the images suggests metaphors of prescription and recreational drugs, money, fate, and power. Looking at the album cover, we see a family of four and an empty table with a backdrop of the boat show at Earl's Court. The last venue Zeppelin performed that before the Plans family accident in Greece. The 1956 photo of the boom of San Francisco Bay is eerie and haunting, as Oakland Coliseum was the last show from the 1977 tour. Looking at the back cover, we see a woman acting as medium between a young boy and the object, while Samantha Gates, the girl from the Houses of the Holy Cover, looks at him confused. The stuff on the blackboard is relevant to the Led Zeppelin story as well. We have the number 24. That's Led Zeppelin's final gig in the US on July 24, 1977. We have the number 77 in there as well. Number 80 speaks of John Bonham's passing at the age of 32. A map of Europe suggests their final year on the road and the countries they visited. 7780 is also the last show they ever played in Berlin. Keeping up with the Zeppelin tradition of past efforts, delays in album cover production and held a release date. Weeks before the release, Melody Maker got hold of the cover. Peter Graham was furious. He had his entourage, including Madman John Binden, visiting employees from Hypnosis. They wanted answers and everybody was terrified. They later discovered a young man in Atlantic's record PR department gave Melody Maker the image. While some sources state the official release date as March 31st, the overall consensus say Presence was released on April 5th, 1976. Advance orders for 1 million records in America alone gave it platinum status. An album recorded by the group with no bass, no home, just moving while looking at the horizon. Reporters called Swan Song offices in London to ask about the object's meaning. Nobody knew or cared to explain. Audience and critics' reception was mixed. Sales eventually cooled down and a portion landed on the infamous discount bins at stores, despite their popularity at an all-time high in the United States. Gerald Ford's daughter Susan called them her favorite group on The Dick Cavett Show, and Jimmy Carter talked about listening to their records on his day as governor. Sandy West, she's gonna sing for 
It's called Wild Thing. October 1976, the song remains the same film and soundtrack was the real presence of 1976. Their seventh studio album was overshadowed by an unprecedented move in Zeppelin's history. Management's strange timing seems like... While the song remains the same's premiere is featured on their presence timeline, it doesn't belong there. A movie that promoted stuff from their Atlantic Years catalog did nothing to help poor guy presence. The last time the band released two records in the same year was 1969, but that was actually good for both releases. The seventh one faced an uphill battle to find its place to this day. The fact Swan Song pushed for an all-concert project that had so many roadblocks says a lot of their hopes for presence. Because Zeppelin had been away from the stage for so long, it seems the 1977 tour was not about promoting the new album, but a continuation of their concert film hype and comeback past the movie theater. I will cover the making of the song remains the same on a separate video, but I can state the record business in 1976 played a major role in having Zeppelin release the soundtrack, despite having a studio album on the shelves. You see, record buyers had 93 live albums to choose from in 1976. It was a trending business move. The big hit record from this live document frenzy was Peter Frampton's Comes Alive, at the fifth highest selling album of 1976, right under Jan Michel Jarre's Oxygen, Boston's self titled debut, and both the Eagles' greatest hits in Hotel California. Frampton's seminal release shaped the latter part of the decade in full force. Label executives took note and Zeppelin was no exception. Knowing the plan, Jones and Bonham greatly admired McCartney's work. I dare to speculate Wings was a major influence and the song remains the same coming to life in 76. The band released both a studio album and their whopping Wings Over America 3 LP set from their heavily documented Six Leg 65 show world tour. Rush did the same thing on a smaller scale. 2112 and at the world stage positioned them as one of the heaviest bands from the 70s, hungry to gain a massive following over the next two decades. Most live albums released in 76 featured concerts captured earlier that year or 1975. Led Zeppelin's drawing power was so big only they could get away with a three-year-old concert from 73. Ironically, President sold almost the exact same number of records as Wings at the speed of sound. Led Zeppelin's seventh studio album was beaten by ACDC, Kansas, Aerosmith, Steve Miller Band, a soundtrack, Bob Skaggs, Stevie Wonder, ABBA, Bob Seger, ACDC again, four greatest hits albums, and the five top spots mentioned before. Presence did manage to sell more copies than Rush, Kiss, Queen, Electric Light Orchestra, Al Stewart, and The Stones. October 1976. Filmmaker Kenneth Anger had a public disagreement with the Page household after Jimmy's wife Charlotte threw Anger out of the house where he was working on Lucifer Rising. Kenneth claimed Jimmy failed to honor their agreement to deliver a complete soundtrack. He criticized Page and said that Kenneth Anger cursed over him. November 1976, Robert Plant was back on his farm in Wales with his wife and children. Life surrounded by nature helped Robert slowly heal his leg. Of physical graffiti in presence now? Well, or we haven't you, had an opportunity. Would you with presence and did we, you with physical graffiti? Yes, yeah, we haven't had an opportunity with presence yet. There are a couple of things that I think that we'll work on, but. Uh... Rehearsals for Led Zeppelin's 11th year's tour took place in late 1976 through January of 1977. A movie theater in London converted into a rehearsal space was used as headquarters. The venue was Manticore Studios, owned by Emerson Lake and Palmer. 
It helped the band work out the setlist, like finding the proper one-man guitar arrangement for Achilles' last stand. While American fans bought tickets for all 52 scheduled shows, the British music scene and market was changing with punk and new wave growing stronger among younger crowds. All bands like Led Zeppelin were criticized as being out of touch to what the kids were playing. The working class mindset of new acts was in opposite direction of isolated stadium rock millionaires. The band responded with Jimmy and Robert going to see punk bands like The Damned. The 1977 US tour was scheduled to begin in March, with Zeppelin using February for last minute details and logistics. Their instruments and gear were shipped off to the States. A few days before flying for opening night, Robert Plant was diagnosed with tonsillitis. He had no voice nor energy, and the tour was postponed for an entire month of no rehearsals. Quite a dangerous move for Jimmy, who didn't touch a guitar until April. A busy mind is better than anxiously waiting and looking for other distractions. Peter Grant's divorce from his wife Gloria was a wound he would never recover from. She was tired of Peter's life on the road in excess. While Grant managed to keep custody of his two children, something quite extraordinary back then, Gloria leaving him added insult to injury on an already unstable character who headed towards depression, chemical paranoia, and dangerous mood swings angry at himself and others for his loss. Where Peter Grant was the one keeping everybody happy in the past, he slowly became disconnected and nobody could emotionally lift him up. Quote Richard Cole, I think that was the end of everything. I hated the last tour. You could feel it. Something very bad. It was all the drugs, I suppose. I don't know, but there was something wrong. It wasn't the same. With most of the road crew on heroin and other assorted pastimes, a negative vibe surrounded the Swan Song and Zeppelin Corporation. The band's first leg of the tour began on April Fools with 17 shows played all the way up to April 30th. Zeppelin's overall set list here was hard-hitting, daring, and wild. Everything they were known for compiled in one long and fascinating collection of songs. The acoustic set was revived so Robert could sit down and relax his leg. He wasn't running around on stage. That job was left for a dangerously thin Jimmy Page dancing and dog walking as much as he could. Bonham and Jones were consistent with polished chops that rescued their guitar and vocal counterparts on more than one occasion. Robert's singing was better than 1975 with phrasing control, but Jimmy was the opposite alternating between rhythm guitar greatness, erratic lead playing, and sudden bursts of inspiration. Presence was represented with just two cuts, Achilles' Last Hand and Nobody's Fault But Mine. Both Achilles and Nobody's Fault were ambitious tracks that got the most out of Jones and Bonham's connection to each other's feel and intensity. Jimmy was not in top form to play these numbers, but pulled through with pure survival instinct. Robert was able to express himself with these songs past the wheelchair recording of Presence. He delivered solid and confident renditions overall.
May 1977, Led Zeppelin had two weeks off before the second leg of their US tour. Jimmy Page visited Cairo before returning to London, where the band plus Peter Grant received the Ivor Novello Award for Outstanding Contribution to British Music on May 12th. Peter Grant later described the event as one of his proudest moments with the band. A press release on May 16th announced Led Zeppelin would continue their record-breaking US tour, with several concerts scheduled for July and August. The band had a second two-week vacation period after their series of shows at the Forum in June. Past the Oakland Coliseum shows, the band would go on to New Orleans on July 30th, August 2nd and 3rd at Chicago Stadium, Buffalo's Ridge Stadium on August 6th, and Pittsburgh Arena on August 9th and 10th. You can check out episode 3 of The Making of Into the Outdoor for my visual summary of events that led to the tragic ending of the 1977 tour.
Looking at all this information, it cares to say and ask the what if question. What if they didn't record Presence and just released The Song Remains the Same in 76? Okay, I'll take a guess here. First things first, Iron Maiden's Steve Harris is not inspired by Achilles Last Stand. He takes cue from Judas Priest's early works instead. Kiss never records I Was Made For Loving You and Break Up in 1981. Jimmy Page finishes the Lucifer Rising soundtrack and Kenneth Anger praises his work. The band settles in Montreux with Robert's recovery making great progress, plus his family visiting from time to time. Jones, Page and Bonham work on a crazy instrumental piece with drums, electronic percussion, funk guitars and synthesizers. They think about contacting Giorgio Moroder at Musicland Studios to produce an experimental session, but discard the idea after a plan walks in one day and says he'd like to see Donna Summer play Days and Confused. Everybody laughs and Bonham shouts, well at least she can dance and moan better than you Robert. Peter Grant books a small US tour from May until late June 1977. With no Achilles or nobody's fault they do Celebration Day and In the Light, played right after Jimmy's violin and Bo Thurman solo. They go back to Switzerland, recording sessions for their seventh studio album begin in late July at Mountain Studios with a slow blues number T401 and Hot Sun for Nowhere. The project is shelved after Robert gets devastating news about his son. All four Led Zeppelin members attend Carrick's funeral. They reunite midway through 1978 to rehearse and later record in through the outdoor. Outtakes from the sessions include Ozone Baby, T for One with Jones on keyboards, and Wearing and Tearing. The 1979 and 1980 shows feature four new songs, In the Evening, All My Love, Hot Dog, and Carousel Umbra. The band reunites in 2007 with Jason Bonham on drums. Their set list includes The Rain Song and the first ever performance of Carousel Umbra. One can dream, right? With the tragic events before and after the recording of Presence, I say the album should have been called Premonition, with the object a reminder of things to come. A seven song seventh album that got them busy while the horizon looked grim. The sum of all parts deliver a strong and explosive record that feels like the band is performing in your living room. A very special snapshot of a true band on the run, exhaling and inhaling success. In between the gigantic expectations from the money making business partners, good and bad, Led Zeppelin stuck to making music, escaping everybody's expectations, and recording one of their most misunderstood adventures in a career that couldn't do no wrong. Their lowest selling studio album is a badge of honor, for badge holders only. This record is a private club into Zeppelin fandom exile, away from rules, the place where time stopped, the chamber of release, solitude and mirrors. Whatever the object means for everyone, the songs are precious and tangibles forever. When a minute seems like a lifetime, let us grab our headphones, and feel this way. This was the making of presents. Be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and wait for future episodes on JCM Led Zeppelin Stories. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Stop.